Hey guys, today we'll be taking a look at the 2022 Governor's Map based on the latest polls from every single state on this map. We'll be going over every single Governor election this year as we are now just one month away from the midterms, which will occur on the 8th of November. We're just 31 days away. These elections are fast approaching and the Governor elections are going to be some of the most important ones of the year. And so we have a ton of races to cover today, so we're just going to get right into it. Starting off with Oregon, we're going to move across the continental United States and then finish off in Florida. So starting off here in the state of Oregon, Tina Kotek is struggling to win against Christine Drazen and Betsy Johnson. This is the only major three-way race that we have this year. And Betsy Johnson is a former Democrat independent that's running against Kotek and Drazen. And if Betsy Johnson was not in this race, Tina Kotek would become the next governor of Oregon for sure. But as, of course, this is now a three-way race, Tina Kotek really is struggling against Christine Drazen, and a big reason for this is because of the unpopularity of Kate Brown, who was barely re-elected in 2018 in one of the most democratic states in the country, and of course 2018 was also a blue wave year. So Brown's 6.4% margin was terrible four years ago, and so in 2022, with a national environment more favorable to the GOP, it is very possible that Christine Drazen is elected the next governor of Oregon at this point. I see still have Tina Kotek favored, but according to the polls, Christine Drayson has taken a 1.2% lead. Next up in California, Gavin Newsom is running for re-election after surviving his recall election pretty easily last year. He won 60% of the votes in favor of not recalling him. Only 40% came out and voted to remove the governor. And so against Brian Dale, Gavin Newsom is on track to easily win re-election by probably a more solid margin than he did last time. And so of course, California is going to be a very solid state. We're not seeing anything like Oregon and California Oregon may flip, California, there's absolutely no chance of that occurring. However, in Nevada, we have one of the closest races of the year. This is between Governor Steve Sisolak and Sheriff Joe Lombardo, who is a sheriff of Clark County, the largest county in the state. That, of course, is the county that Las Vegas is located in. So despite Steve Sisolak winning his first term by four points in 2018, he is currently struggling to win a second one. And so is Catherine Cortez Masto in her attempt to win a second term as U.S. Senator against Adam Luxalt. So against Sisolak, though, Joe Lombardo is doing much better than Luxalt was in 2018 and has led in most of the most recent polls. Many polls show an even race, and so despite Democrats outperforming expectations in 2018, this race is going to go down to the wire. I think that both Sislak and Lombardo have a very good chance. You cannot count out see if Sislak, he is still the incumbent governor, and being the incumbent comes with many advantages. But right now, according to the polls, Joe Lombardo is currently expected to win by a tilt margin. In Arizona, we have another one of the most competitive races of the year, this time between Katie Hobbs and Carrie Lake. Despite Doug Ducey being easily re-elected in 2018, Republicans are not doing nearly as well as they were four years ago this time around. Carrie Lake is a pretty weak nominee, but she still does have a very good shot at winning. 538 has this as the closest governor election of the year, with both candidates having exactly a 50% chance at victory, but Katie Hobbs has led in the most recent polls. Things are starting to look up for her slightly according to these newer numbers, but Carrie Lake did lead by four points according to the Trafalgar Group, and a four-point margin is pretty significant for a Republican, especially if it's conducted by the Trafalgar Group. That probably does mean that Carrie Lake does have some sort of advantage at least, but right now we're definitely seeing a very competitive election here in Arizona. It can go both ways, but a flipper Democrats would be pretty major, as of course this is a governorship that Republicans currently control, but according to the polls, unlike Nevada, Democrats are going to have the slight advantage here, with it also being a tilt rating. Next up in Colorado, Jared Polis is up by 15 points in the polls as he continues to expand his lead over Heidi Gonnell. I mean, some very good numbers for the incumbent Democrat over the last couple of weeks. He was easily elected in 2018, winning by 11%. He might even do better this year, despite 2022 being a significantly worse year for Democrats overall. But 538 currently gives Jared Polis an over 99% chance at winning re-election. Democrats definitely did a good job choosing Polis as their nominee four years ago because he is going to deliver a very strong margin for the party this year in the state of Colorado. They say that Joe Biden won by 14 points in 2020. I think the margin is going to be somewhere around that. Jared Polis easily on track to winning, and so Colorado is going to be the second solid Democratic state on this map. 
And moving on to New Mexico, Michelle Lujan Grisham was a pretty vulnerable incumbent. She's not that popular in her state, but her approval has gone up slightly in the last couple of months, and that's making her re-election bid against Mark Ranchetti slightly easier. She does have sexual misconduct allegations against her, so despite winning by 14 points last time, Michelle Lujan Grisham is in a significantly more competitive race, but 530, it still gives her a very high 87% chance of winning. Democrats realistically are not going to lose in New Mexico. It's a state that they've won countless times in the last decade, and even the most Republican polls show Michelle Lujan Grisham winning her re-election against Mark Ranchetti. Ranchetti was a good choice by the GOP, a very moderate candidate that was competitive in 2020 for the Senate seat against Ben Ray Lujan, but at this point, he's just not going to win. Michelle Lujan Grisham is probably going to win by a likely margin, but a significantly weaker likely margin compared to her win in 2018. And now we have the election in Kansas to look at. This is going to be the third out of the four most competitive races this year, with the other three being, of course, Nevada, Arizona, and then Wisconsin. So in Kansas right now, Laura Kelly is struggling for her political survival. Yes, she's leading in the polls, but we've only gotten three polls in the last two months. And polls in Kansas can be very, very inaccurate. They were pretty inaccurate in 2020. They did favor Joe Biden significantly over Donald Trump. But right now, Laura Kelly is doing significantly better than expected. She actually is favored according to the 530 forecast as they give her a 65% chance at winning re-election. We're just going to have to wait for more data. This is going to be one of the closest watch races of the year as a Democrat attempts to win re-election in one of the most conservative states in the country. Laura Kelly won by five points in 2018. Kansas was likely Democratic in 2018, but this year is probably going to be lean or even tilt, but the polls only suggest a 3.7% margin of victory three for Kelly, making it a lean Democratic state. And then in Oklahoma, Kevin State is just not where he should be. Joy Hoffmeister, a former Republican, is really surging in the polls. She's only behind by 9.8% now. This is an abysmally small margin, considering the fact that Trump carried the state by 33 points in 2020 and then 36 points in 2016. But this is not the first time that Kevin State is seeing an underwhelming margin. In 2018, he only won his first term by 12 points. And so in 2022, he's probably going to see a pretty similar margin as Joy Hoffmeister is doing better and better in the polls. Kevin State's own campaign poll only has him up by barely a solid 15-point margin, so Oklahoma is going to be a likely Republican state on our map. In the Lone Star State of Texas, Better O'Rourke really isn't where he wants to be. He was a star candidate in 2018 when he ran for the Senate seat against Ted Cruz. He only lost by 2.8%, but after a disastrous 2020 presidential campaign, Greg Abbott is probably going to win his third term against Beto O'Rourke. O'Rourke is the best nominee Democrats could have chosen, but that's probably not going to be enough for them to flip a state as red as Texas in a year as red as 2022. Greg Abbott is leading by pretty consistent margins in the most latest polls. They basically all agree that Abbott is ahead by 7-8%, to and I think that's the margin he's going to win by. It's going to be a lot closer than it was in 2018 when you had a relatively unknown Democratic nominee, but with Beto O'Rourke on the ballot, the race is going to be close closer, but not an assured win for Democrats at all. Republicans are going to win a third term with Greg Abbott as the nominee, and this will make Texas another likely Republican state. And so to finish off the continental west, we don't actually have polls from Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, or Nebraska, nor do we have data from Hawaii, where Josh Green is going to succeed David Ige. But we do have data from Alaska, where we're seeing Mike Dunleavy on track to winning re-election against both Bill Walker and Les Gara. Les Gara is a Democratic nominee, while Bill Walker is the former independent governor who served from 2014 until 2018. Bill Walker did not run for re-election in 2018, and so Mike Dunleavy right now looks like he is is going to be facing off against Gara in the final round of ranked choice voting, and against Gara, he is up by 12.5%, and so this is going to make Alaska a likely Republican state, and Mike Dunleavy actually is going to be the first governor of Alaska to be re-elected since 1998. And so now that we have the western half of the country done, we're going to move on to the Midwest, probably the most polarized region in the entire country. We're seeing very interesting races in all of these states, especially in Wisconsin. This is going to be a tipping point race for Democrats. But we're going to start off here in Minnesota, where Tim Walls is running for re-election against Scott Jensen. Walls is just doing better and better. He's now ahead by 9.6% in the polls, and he has a very good chance at winning it by double digits. Even Scott Jensen's own campaign poll, along with a Trafalgar poll, have Walls away 
winning his re-election pretty easily. Obviously, he's going to win by over three points. He won by double digits last time. I think 10 to 11 percent may be possible, but it's more likely that he wins by seven to eight. And right now, the polling numbers are definitely suggesting a strong victory for Democrats in the state of Minnesota. 538 gives Tim Walls a 94 percent chance at winning re-election. So Minnesota is going to be a likely Democratic state based on the latest data. Next up in Iowa, Kim Reynolds is also running for re-election. She was first elected in 2018 in a pretty close election. She only won by 2.7% against Mike Hubble. This was a really close race, considering that Donald Trump carried Iowa by almost double digits in 2016. But this time, Kim Reynolds is going to win by a significantly larger margin. She's up by 17 points against Dedry Dejir. Dejir is not too interesting of a candidate. Kim Reynolds has been relatively popular as governor over the last four years, and so she is on track to winning a second full term in office, making Iowa a solid Republican state, the first state on this map so far, with polling suggesting a solid margin for the GOP. And now moving on to Wisconsin, Tony Evers and Tim Michaels are in a very close election. Incumbent Tony Evers won his first term by 1.1% in 2018 against Scott Walker, who was the incumbent Republican at the time. He already served two terms and was running for a third. And so the win for Evers was pretty impressive four years ago, but it looks like he is in trouble this time. Around a 0.7% lead that's shrinking is not the best sign, but he does have a good chance. He's going to outperform Mandela Barnes definitely. Tony Evers is still leading in many of the most recent polls. There were three polls in a row that had Michaels leading, but the Trafalgar group showing Tim Michaels leading by 1% is not significant at all. I think this election is going to go down to the wire just like Nevada, just like Arizona, but right now, as the incumbent, Tony Evers is favored with a 0.7% lead in the polls. 538 continues to favor Tony Evers over his Republican opponent, giving him a 59% chance at winning re-election. In Illinois, J.B. Pritzker is also running for re-election. Darren Bailey is his Republican challenger, and it's entirely possible that Pritzker wins by a solid margin because most of the polls conducted have been done by Republican sponsors. And so right now, J.B. Pritzker up by 15 points, slightly under, will make Illinois just a likely Democratic state, but I do think that there's a good chance that he does win by over 15 points, but no matter what, J.B. Pritzker is on track to winning a second term in office. In the race in Michigan, we're also seeing some pretty solid numbers for Democrats. Gretchen Whitmer up by 13% against Theodore Dixon. This was going to be a very competitive election when James Craig was not disqualified yet, but after his disqualification, Tudor Dixon became the nominee, and she is somebody that is just way too extreme on many of her views, and she's sinking her own campaign. Gretchen Whitmer is doing better and better. Her lead is starting to expand more and more as this election goes on, and currently she has a 96% chance at winning, according to 538, but according to just the polls, she's going to win by a very strong likely margin. In the Buckeye state of Ohio, we're seeing an election very similar to the one in Iowa. Kim Reynolds won her first term narrowly in 2018. Mike DeWine did so as well against Richard Cordray four years ago. But this time, Mike DeWine is in a much better position. He's up by 17 points against Nan Whaley. Leads in every single poll, double digits. I mean, 20 points, according to Siena College. Mike DeWine is going to win re-election. He did survive a primary challenge by Jim Renacci. He was supported by Donald Trump. Mike DeWine easily won that renomination and is now going to easily win his re-election to a second term. And the final race we have in the Midwest is going to be between Josh Shapiro and Doug Mastriano. Doug Mastriano, as I've said before, the worst Republican gubernatorial nominee this year. Josh Shapiro is going to win this election. There is no doubt about that. Doug Mastriano has no support even from mainstream Republicans. He's just way too extreme. I think Josh Shapiro can win by double digits. Tom Wolf won by 18 points of 17 points in 2018. Josh Shapiro is going to win by a margin slightly smaller, but still a very impressive margin considering that Joe Biden only carried the state by 1.2% in 2020. So, the state of Pennsylvania is going to be an easy win for Democrats. I think on the Senate level, the election is going to be closer, but also a win for the Democratic Party with John Fetterman winning his seat. But on the gubernatorial level, it's going to be not even close. 
And now we're going to move on into the Northeast, starting off with the Empire State of New York. Kathy Hochul is running for re-election here. She's winning by 14 points right now in the polls. And she only took office in late 2021 in August when Andrew Cuomo was forced to resign. So Hochul, as lieutenant governor, became the governor of New York, the first female governor of the state, actually. So she did make history, but her tenure has been pretty mediocre. Lee Zeldin is running a pretty strong campaign. And for comparison, Chuck Schumer leads by 23% in his Senate race against Joe Pinion. So Democrats on the gubernatorial level aren't doing well, but Kathy Hochul is still going to win re-election, and I do think she will win by at least double digits. However, in both Vermont and New Hampshire, Democrats are going to struggle. These are both going to be solid Republican states. In Vermont, Phil Scott leads by 38% against Brenda Siegel, while in New Hampshire, Chris Nunu is ahead by 16 points against Tom Sherman. This election is actually getting closer, but Chris Nunu is still a very popular governor and will easily win his fourth term, considering the fact that New Hampshire is a pretty Democratic state, much bluer than it is red. Chris Nunu might have won by 30 points in 2020, but that's not going to happen again. The race this year is going to be closer, but still a win for Republicans in both New Hampshire and Vermont, making both of these states solid red. Next up in Maine, Janet Mills is running for re-election against Paula Page. Paula Page is a former two-term governor, but really not that great of a candidate now that we have this two-way race. Janet Mills is doing very well in the most recent polls. Every poll released in September has shown her head by double digits, and Paula Page only won his two terms because there are three or sometimes even four candidates running. In 2014, he won re-election by just five points, but Cutler won 8.4% of the vote and made a huge impact on this race. And if you go back to 2010, it was actually a four-way race and Paul LePage only won 38% of the vote with three major candidates. So Paul LePage's victories in his two terms were not the greatest. And that's why, even though he's the former governor, he's really not that formidable of a challenger against Janet Mills, who is leading by a likely margin. Next up in Massachusetts, Mara Healy is running for the governorship of the state after Charlie Baker announced that he would not be running for a third term. Baker, of course, was a Republican that was re-elected by 33 points in 2018 in the second most Democratic state in the country, according to the results of the 2020 election. So Mara Healy is going to take this state back for Democrats, though, as she's on track to defeating Jeff Deal. This race isn't going to be close at all. Massachusetts is going to be solid blue once again. In neighboring Connecticut, Led Lamont leads by 12.9 points against Bob Stefanowski, who he barely defeated back in 2018, but this race is going to be considerably more solid for the Democrats this time around as Lamont seeks a second term, and so Connecticut is going to be a likely Democratic state. But in Rhode Island, we do have a solid race here as Dan McKee is seeking his first full term in office after succeeding Gina Raimondo last year, who went on to become Biden's Secretary of Commerce. And so Dan McKee is up by 18 points. He actually almost lost his primary to become the governor, but as the sitting governor, he did so barely come out on top, and that is enough for him to be the Democratic nominee. And of course, in a state as blue as Rhode Island, he is going to easily defeat Ashley Callis to win his first full term. In Maryland, we have another eminent flip for the Democratic Party as Wes Moore is on track to easily defeat Dan Cox. Moore is up by 32 and 22 points, an average of 27%. The Washington Post A-plus rated pollster has Moore up by 32 points. Maryland is not even going to be close after Larry Hogan won re-election by double digits in 2018. So this will also be another governorship that's going to return back into the hands of the Democratic Party. And so this will give Democrats their 23rd governorship, which means that if Democrats win these races, they're actually going to gain the number of governorships that they control, which is a pretty big deal considering that 2022 was not supposed to be a good year for their party. And now we're finally going to come down to the Deep South. So starting off with Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is on track to defeating Chris Jones. She leads by 22 points in the polls. She was the former press secretary for Donald Trump for a couple of years, and her father was also the former governor of Arkansas. So she has a very long history in terms of her family being in Arkansas politics, and that's why she's pretty easily going to win her first term in the governor's mansion, making this a solid red race. We also have races in Tennessee and Alabama. We don't have polls from these races, but they're also going to be very solid for Republicans, but we do have polls from these three remaining elections. 
So starting off with South Carolina, Henry McMaster is running for his second term in office. He first took office after Nikki Haley resigned, and so she did become the governor a couple of years before he won his first term in 2018. He only won by 8 points, and this time, it looks like he's going to win by the exact same margin, at least according to the polls. I mean, the Trafalgar group has McMaster only leading by 8 points. Joe Cunningham is running a very strong campaign, but in the end, he's not going to win this race. Realistically, Henry McMaster is going to win re-election. It's almost guaranteed, but the margin is probably not going to be that solid. The polls currently only suggest a likely margin of victory. In Georgia, we saw a pretty big shift in the Senate election as Herschel Walker is probably going to lose that race. At this point, I'm convinced that Raphael Warnock is on track to winning re-election, but on the gubernatorial level, Brian Kemp is still poised to win re-election. Stacey Abrams, just not as strong as she was four years ago. The national environment is simply different. Democrats are really flipped Georgia in 2020. They don't have the motivation, or not as much of a motivation, to flip it on the gubernatorial level this time around. They're probably going to vote to re-elect Raphael Warnock, but Brian Kemp, as the incumbent governor is probably going to win re-election himself as well as a Republican. Georgia is still a state with a very long history of voting for the GOP, and so a Democrat winning here would still be a pretty big surprise in a year where Joe Biden is the sitting Democratic president. So Georgia is going to be another likely Republican state. And finally, in Florida, Ron DeSantis is on track to winning his re-election against Charlie Crist. Of course, if DeSantis wants to run for president in 2024, he's going to have to win re-election as governor of a state that's shifting more and more to the right. If he loses, there's no chance he's ever going to become president. Now, Charlie Crist is the former governor, but with Hurricane Ian, I think it's going to hurt his campaign. I think Ron DeSantis is going to get a boost from the natural disaster. And so we actually have not seen polls from the state over the last week as Floridians are recovering from the recent hurricane. And so, of course, I do send my best wishes to those in the state. But right now, Ron DeSantis is on track to winning re-election. And so this makes all three of these southeastern races all likely Republican. And so this is the 2022 governor's map based on the latest polls, exactly one month out from the midterms on the 8th of November. Obviously, I don't think the map is actually going to look like this in the very end. I think in these closed races, Kansas may even be tilled. Oregon, I think, still favors Democrats, even the Republicans are ahead in the polls. But definitely a very interesting map. We have some very competitive elections this year to watch. And so I will keep you guys updated on this channel for any election-related news for 2022. So make sure you subscribe to stay updated and I will see you guys in the next video.